right, so today we're going to be talking about Jesus as the commander of the armies of heaven and the resplendent angel that we read about in Revelation chapter 18. We're going to be looking at a whole lot of verses here. Some verses are passages that I know you're going to be familiar with in terms of their end time passages. We're going to look at things in Revelation and we're going to compare them to other passages of scripture that we see in the Old Testament, comparing scripture with scripture. We're going to be looking at passages in the Gospels, particularly the passages in Matthew 24 and in Luke 17 that talk about people fleeing into the wilderness or and the passages where one is taken and one is left. And I'm going to show you that those particular passages have nothing to do with the rapture and I will show you what they do have to do with. Jesus is the commander of the armies of heaven and we read about that in Revelation chapter 19 when Jesus is seen as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords uh, coming as the mighty warrior king on his white horse in Revelation 19. Verse 13, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Jesus commands the armies of heaven, not or the armies in heaven, not just one army. Jesus' armies are both human and angelic. So he has uh, angels and people, glorified people, who are part of his army. In 1 Thessalonians 1 7 we read about the angelic host who will accompany Christ at his return and I'm just going to start uh, with part of verse 7 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. In Revelation 17, the last half of verse 14, the Lamb will overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. To be called is to be part of the ecclesia. In fact, the, the root word of this word for called is uh, the root word that we get our word church or ecclesia. The chosen, they're called, chosen, and faithful. And then Jude verse 7 says this, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. So all of the armies of heaven are going to be accompanying Christ at his return in Revelation 19. Now, we did look at um, Jesus as the commander of of the Lord's armies in Joshua chapter 5 in the last video and he is the angel of the Lord that God promised would help uh, the nation of Israel once they came into the promised land God said that he would send his angel to to help conquer the land and so here is the Lord Jesus before he was born in Bethlehem showing up as the commander of the Lord's armies who is also called a man who is also called the angel of the Lord who is God he's worshiped by Joshua in that passage so what I want to do today is I'm going to lay out a pattern for you um, because prophecy is partially interpreted via patterns so one of the ways we understand the prophetic end time prophecies is through looking at Old Testament patterns Okay, so there is a pattern of warfare and deliverance that God uses. And this is a pattern that repeats itself a number of times in the Old Testament. This is a pattern of what God does when he's about ready to judge a city or the world or whatever. The first thing that he does is he reconnoiters. Okay, to, to reconnoiter means you're going to go in and you're going to before you do any kind of judgment or before you do anything, you're going to check out the situation and see if it is as your intelligence has told you it is. And it's interesting that God does this. Uh, we would think that he knows everything, that he doesn't need to do this. But for whatever reason, uh, God lets us know that he is actually going to be on the ground 
um, getting firsthand information. And he does this through his son, through the angel, through sometimes he's called a man, sometimes he's called the Lord uh, in the Old Testament. And the next thing that he does once he ascertains that a group of people or a city or whatever is it's time for them to be judged, like, say, Sodom, for example, the next thing he does is he delivers the righteous, okay? So the, first he reconnoiters, he finds out, does a little reconnaissance to see what's going on, and then he delivers the righteous. The third thing that happens after the righteous are delivered is the destruction or the judgment. So the example that I want to look at here first is the example of Sodom. So when God was about to judge Sodom, he came down. It says that the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre. Uh, the Lord appeared, that is Yahweh, appeared in the form of a man, and I believe this is a pre-incarnate form of Christ. Okay, this is when he showed up at, at looking like a man, but Abraham recognized that he wasn't just a man. He was also the Lord. And he appeared with two angels who came with him. And there were a couple of things that the Lord was going to do here. Uh, one is he wanted to deliver a message to Abraham that about this time next year, he was going to have a son. Okay, that would be Isaac, the son of promise, that both Sarah and Abraham were very old, too old to have children, but God promised that uh, this time next year that they would have a baby, and that's when Sarah laughed, and you know the story. The second part of this, uh, the two angels that are with um, the Lord uh, go on into uh, Sodom, and the Lord says this in Genesis 18, verse 17. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and through him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. For I've chosen him so that he will command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, in order that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he's promised. And then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great. Because their sin is so grievous, I will go down to see if their actions fully justify the outcry that has reached me, and if not, I'll find out. So, a couple of things are happening here. One, the angel of the Lord, who is God, appears to Abraham. And remember, if this was God the Father, uh, Abraham couldn't see him because no man can see the Father and survive. He dwells in unapproachable light. But the only son who is in the bosom of the Father, he's made him known. We can know God the Father by looking at his son, Jesus. And the Lord... Uh, brought the message to Abraham, okay, and this is a kind of a double thing he's doing there. He, he's, number one, going to bring a message to Abraham. And then the second thing he does is he's uh, checking out to see if his information about the evil and the wickedness of Sodom is true or not. And he's also going to engage Abraham in um, the discussion about Sodom. And in this case, Abraham is sort of pleading for the life of his nephew, Lot, who lives in Sodom. And uh, finally, they get down to if there's 10 people there, he won't destroy it. But there weren't 10 people. And uh, verse 33, when the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he departed and Abraham returned home. Okay, so that's the story of the reconnoitering and the uh, giving of a message. So there's a couple things that can happen during this phase, and we do see this in other places in Revelation, where there's a message that's being delivered in addition to some other action that's taking place. And I think of Revelation chapter 10, where the mighty angel, who is Christ, resurrects the dead and changes the living, and he also has a little scroll in his hand that he's going to deliver. So the second part of this pattern has to do with deliverance or rescue, and that's what the two angels, the two men who accompanied the Lord, are going to do. So they go into Sodom, uh, Genesis 19, verses 12 and 13. Then the two men said to Lot, Do you have anyone else here, a son-in-law, your sons or daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of here, because we're about to destroy this place. For the outcry to the Lord against its people is so great that he sent us to destroy it. So God has sent these two angels to be his 
hitmen. Okay, they're the ones who are basically going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and the rest of the cities on the plain. Now, as it ended up, uh, there was only Lot and his two daughters who made it out of Sodom. Lot and his family were delivered by those two angels who went into the city. The Lord himself didn't go into Sodom. He sent his messengers to Lot. The messengers had a certain amount of time to complete their mission, which was why they were rushing Lot to get him out of the city, because there was a certain window during which time it appears that they had to destroy the cities. And so Lot and his daughters had sort of got out in the nick of time and his wife left but then she looked back and it was too late for her she turned into a pillar of salt so th that's the third thing that happened then was destruction and judgment rained down on Sodom and the surrounding area and they were destroyed at God's command Genesis 19 I'm just going to read a few verses here then the Lord rained down sulfur and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens, and thus he destroyed these cities and the entire plain, including all the inhabitants of the cities and everything that grew on the ground. And early the next morning Abraham got up and returned to the place where he'd stood before the Lord, and he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and all the land of the plain, and he saw smoke rising from the land like smoke from a furnace. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham, and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that destroyed the cities where he had lived. So the question now is, what was the sin of Sodom? Okay, so why was Sodom destroyed? Okay, I'm going to give you two reasons why. There's some more beside. I'm not listing all the reasons why Sodom was destroyed, but I'm going to list two of them that are important for our discussion today. The first one is immorality, okay, and they were known for sexual immorality, and going after strange flesh. Now, you may wonder, what am I talking about? What's the deal with strange flesh? Uh, Jude 6 and 7 talks about this. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode. He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of that great day. This is a, a verse about the watchers, the, the sons of God who went into the daughters of men and created these hybrids just before the flood. They didn't keep their proper domain. That is, their domain was a spiritual heavenly domain, and they decided they wanted an earthly domain. So they left their own abode. They left their dwelling, which wasn't talking about heaven. It's talking about their own personal temple, their personal dwelling place, which was their body. They left their spiritual body and they took on a human body so that they could have relations with human women and raise up hybrid children. That's what they wanted to do. And they've been reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So at the time of the end, at the time of the fifth trumpet, when that trumpet blows, these angels who uh, will, along with their king, Apollyon, be released from the pit. Verse 7, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. The strange flesh is uh, um, where now people, humans, are doing to angels what angels did to people. So these angels took on um, a form, uh, the watchers took on human form, and they had relations with uh, human women. Okay. In this case, now the reverse is happening. There are human men who, when they see uh, angelic beings, want to have relations with them. They want it, it's it's all about having a connection or oneness with uh, someone that's immortal. So this is uh, the the strange flesh that we're talking about here. And any time we see um, hybrids or people who are wanting to have a relation with uh, fallen entities, God takes a very dim view of that. And that's when he steps into judgment. So 
for example, in Genesis 6, we read about that there were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old men of renown. So during the time before the flood, this happened and also afterward. And we know that some of these hybrids were um, the people who populated the land of Canaan. And that's why God was going to destroy them or have the Israelites destroy them because they were hybrid beings. They weren't fully human. A lot of them were giants even. So this practice of having relations with um, angels apparently was common enough uh, where God had to come down and check it out and see what's going on here. And the practice then of these men of Sodom wanting to have relations with these uh, two angels who showed up at Lot's house, it wasn't because they were, you know, new guys in town. It was because they were angels. It was because they were spirit beings and they were recognized as being that. This is all very creepy and uh, it gives you some understanding into the level of corruption and defilement that existed back in those days and who knows how much of this is still going on today. But the men of Sodom were apparently given over to this practice whenever they had the opportunity and it happened often enough where this was a thing. Uh, you know, to me, it's just beyond comprehension. So, but instead of angels, wicked angels defiling women or people, now it's people who are trying to defile God's messengers. God takes a very dim view of this and when these things happen, this is when his judgment comes into play. Now, the Tower of Babel is another incident where we see a pattern of God uh, reconnoitering, coming in, doing a little reconnaissance. Uh, he doesn't deliver the righteous, though, and he postpones destruction. We're going to take a look at that. And the reason why he does this is because these two parts, delivering the righteous and um, pouring out destruction, are going to happen during the time of the end. This is when mystery Babylon, Babel, okay, goes ba Babylon and Babel, same word. This is when mystery Babylon will finally be, be destroyed. That's at the end. This is when people are going to be delivered just before the destruction of Mystery Babylon. And that's what we're kind of going to look at today. But during the time of the Tower of uh, Babel, the city of Babel was right after the flood and people were told to spread out. Um, they didn't. Um, a guy named Nimrod, uh, who was a very powerful, very, very powerful person and a lot of people think that he became one of these hybrid beings. He became a giant or a mighty man. He rebelled against God and he set up these uh, series of city-states and he became kind of the king, uh, a despot, a rebel on the earth. And the people in uh, Babel, they were happy to have it be that way. They were all in with whatever Nimrod was doing. So here's the reconnaissance aspect. This is what God did in Genesis 11, 5 through 7. Then the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the sons of men were building. And the Lord said, If they have begun to do this as one people speaking the same language, then nothing they devise will be beyond them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord saw what was going on. He came down, saw the tower, and said, you know what, if this continues, nothing that they want to do will be beyond them. Whatever they can imagine, they will be able to do. And of course, the reason why they'll be able to do these things is because of the help that they get from these fallen angels who have all this um, secret kind of esoteric knowledge. So God did not destroy Babel at that time. Uh, he didn't deliver any righteous people because I don't know that there were any who were in Babel at the time. I think they were all in with what Nimrod was doing. Okay, Genesis 11 verses 1 and 4. 
Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. So they wanted to build themselves a city, and they wanted to make a name for themselves. Okay, this is all contrary to God's plan and purposes. So God confused their languages, and they were sort of had to spread out over the whole earth, which they did. But wherever people went, wherever the, um, the people who were present in the, the original Babel, the original Babylon, they took all this knowledge that they had, esoteric knowledge. They took um, the religion, uh, which was sort of combining religion and um, government into the same person, uh, having a, a despotic ruler. They took all of that with them wherever they went in the whole world. So the judgment and destruction of Babel has been postponed, but it hasn't been eliminated. So Mystery Babylon is the harlot of Revelation. And remember, um, the names in Revelation are symbolic. They're telling us something. Uh, the mystery part of it, this is a name of mystery um, it, and refers to um, the mystery religions of olden days. And the fact that this person is a harlot, described as a harlot, um, tells us that she is leading people away from the true and living God, which is what Nimrod was all about. So Mystery Babylon is a continuation, really, of the Tower of Babel and the City of Babel or Babylon and the system of control that originated there through combining false religion and government or politics, um, you know, monarchy, whatever. God didn't wipe out Babel. He only slowed down um, the intense power and influence which would have been unleashed on the world had they continued doing what they were doing. And he did this by confusing the communication of the very first Masons. Since Babel was not destroyed, but only decentralized, the Babylonian or Babel system has slowly spread over the whole world over the ensuing centuries, which is why the harlot is depicted as being seated on many waters, because now the great city of Babel or Babylon is everywhere. Revelation 17, 1 and 15. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Verse 15, then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. Okay, so that should take us back to uh, the, the whole Tower of Babel thing. Okay. So some other examples of this pattern right here of reconnoitering, delivering the righteous, and the destruction or judgment of the wicked are found in the way God dealt with Egypt and the nation of Israel during the time of the Exodus, the way he dealt with um, Judah just before Nebuchadnezzar came in and uh, sort of carried everybody off to Babylon and destroyed Jerusalem. God used Nebuchadnezzar as the means of the discipline and destruction for Jerusalem. And so in the last days, God is going to kind of do the same thing, only it's going to be a reversal. This time, Babylon is going to be the a great city that's uh, judged, and it's going to be uh, the Antichrist, the beast, and ten kings who do that. So let's take a look at Luke chapter 17. This is a familiar passage, and what's interesting is I'd already typed all this up, and then I'm just uh, listening to a, you know, a random uh, Bible study that came up on the uh, YouTube, and there's this guy, and he's talking about this very passage, Luke 17. He's explaining how it's talking about the rapture, pre-tribulation rapture, all of that, and I'm listening to him and going, I don't think you've really read the passage, have you? Because <laughs> if you had, you wouldn't, you wouldn't interpret it that way. So let's take a look at it and see what we see here, okay? And we're not going to read anything into it. We're just going to take the information that we see, and we're going to look at it more closely. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, 
until the day that Noah entered the ark, and, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Okay, three times here the word the day is used. It's used uh, in reference to Noah, the day that he went into the ark, the flood came. And actually, that's not technically true, okay? Noah was in the ark for seven days before the flood came. But there's a reason why... Um, Christ is saying the day that Noah went in, the flood came, and the day that Lot went out, the flood came. Even so, it will be on in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So what does that mean? Even so, it will be in the day uh, the Son of Man is revealed. What does it mean, the day? What day are we talking about? And in what way is the Son of Man revealed? We know the Son of Man is Jesus, but in what way is he revealed and on what day? Uh, verse 31, we're talking about that day still. In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who's in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in that night there will be two men in one bed, and one will be taken and the other left. And two women will be grinding together, one will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field, and one will be taken and the other left. And they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? And he said to them, Wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Okay, Luke 17.30 is talking about a time when Jesus will be revealed to the same people who are going to see the abomination of desolation. That's what he's talking about. If you're in the field, don't go back. Just leave. Okay, this is uh, the same day that Jesus talks about in Matthew 24. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who's on the housetop not go back to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. Verse 23, then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also Will the coming of the Son of Man be? For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Okay, so we're combining all kinds of imagery here. We're combining the imagery of a day, of the day of the abomination of desolation, people fleeing into the wilderness, of people um, of the revelation of the Son of Man, and as lightning comes from the east to the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Uh, we're talking about the destruction of Sodom and, how, uh, and the destruction of the world at the time of Noah. All of this is being compared with a coming destruction at the time of the end. Luke tells us that the destruction of the end will reflect the days of Noah, that it will be business as usual until the day that Noah entered the ark and the day of the coming destruction. What destruction is the Lord referring to? So first off, we see the need for haste in leaving Jerusalem. We see an appearance or a revelation of the Son of Man on the day when the Lord will rain down this particular judgment. Matthew compares Jesus' appearance, or his re revelation, uh, to lightning coming from the east. That is, that Christ's coming will be swift, 
and then he will be gone in a flash. He will not reappear. So don't bother to look for him afterwards. Luke simply says that the Son of Man will be revealed. Both passages mention a body or a carcass and the eagles gathering to the body. All right, so what's the timing of this? All right, we know this is at the midpoint. We know this is at the time of the abomination of desolation. We know that Christ will appear at this time. But this is not the same appearance as his triumphant second coming at the end of the seven years. Both Luke and Matthew say that the Son of Man will come at this time, like lightning flashes from the east to the west. That is not how Christ is going to come at the second coming. He's not going to be a flash. He's going to come down and every eye will see him. The destruction that is going to take place at this time is not Armageddon, okay? That wrath uh, that's associated with what's going to be poured out on the beast in the beast kingdom is after the tribulation of those days when the sun goes dark and the moon uh, turns to blood. Um, and Christ doesn't return until three and a half years or 1,260 days after the midpoint. But there's going to be a destruction here take, that takes place, just like it happened in the days of Sodom. The Sodom and Noah-like destruction will take place at the same time on the day when the woman, the remnant of Revelation 12, will flee into the wilderness on eagle's wings. And we're going to look at a passage about that in a minute. And here, um, in both Luke and Matthew, we see that eagles are being nourished or fed by the body around which they have gathered. So uh, this is a carcass. A lot of people don't like the idea of Jesus uh, kind of referring to, I suppose, himself as a carcass. But the idea is that whoever goes with him is going to be fed by him in the wilderness. And that's where God is going to, have, is going to nourish the woman for 1,260 days. All right, Sodom is also mentioned in Revelation. Okay, Revelation 11, 8. This is the context of when the, um, the Antichrist kills the two witnesses. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So the, the dead bodies um, that lie in the street in Jerusalem, we're not talking about the dead body of the carcass that the eagles uh, surround. We're talking about the two witnesses who are going to be killed. And they're going to be killed in the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. So we know that's Jerusalem. The city is symbolically or spiritually described as Sodom and Egypt. And both of those were places that the righteous fled from, that they were rescued from. The two witnesses will be resurrected at the time of a great earthquake that devastates Jerusalem. It's also the time of the second woe. We know that the second woe is the sixth trumpet. Revelation 11, 11 and following. Now after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, that is the two witnesses, and they stood on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they ascended into heaven in a cloud and their enemies saw them. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. And we know that the, the second woe is the sixth trumpet. And that's, uh, here's what it says in Revelation 9. Then the sixth angel sounded and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of their army of the horsemen was 200 million and out of their mouths came fire, smoke and brimstone. 
By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. So at the sixth trumpet, the second woe, which is right at the midpoint on at the same hour, okay, the same day that the two witnesses uh, ascend into heaven, that's when a third of mankind is killed in one hour. Okay, this is the destruction of Babylon the Great, um, and it's the harlot that's associated with the sixth trumpet. Okay, um, and the harlot is going to be destroyed on a single day at a particular hour. Okay, remember, God has already reconnoitered Babylon to see what she can do. Now, He's going to deliver the righteous and He's going to destroy or bring judgment on the city that has. Yeah, wasn't destroyed, you know, hundreds and thousands of years ago. Revelation 18. This is where we see uh, the angel of the Lord coming down, and he is going to oversee as the commander of the armies of God. He's going to oversee the destruction of Babylon, mystery Babylon, okay? The, the city that grew into this gigantic tree that it shouldn't have been. It grew and it covered the earth. Okay, He's going to destroy that now. Revelation 18. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And that takes us back to that passage in Ezekiel. I believe it's either uh, both Ezekiel chapter 10 and uh, chapter 43, where we see that this glory is coming from this angel who is associated with the son of one like a son of man in Revelation chapter 1. This is the Lord. Verse 2, and he cried uh, mightily with a loud voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. For all the nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. Therefore, her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her." Okay, verse 9, the kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning. And remember the sixth trumpet, the, the people are destroyed with fire, smoke, and sulfur. Standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. The merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour such great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster, all who traveled by ships, sailors, and as many as trade on the sea, stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this great city? And they threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, for the great city, in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she is made desolate. The judgment of the harlot comes on one day at a single hour, and this hour is the midpoint. At the same time, the two witnesses are resurrected, and there is a great earthquake. Revelation 11, 12. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here, and they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Okay, so... Uh, in Revelation, if you follow the word hour, it almost exclusively refers to the hour of the judgment of Babel, of Mystery Babylon, the harlot. 
Now, um, we're going to go into the Old Testament here. We're going to look at a passage in Zechariah that many people interpret as being uh, something that's going to happen at the end of the seven years. But if we know that God is going to send Jesus as his messenger to, over to oversee the destruction of Mystery Babylon, the harlot, uh, the destruction of Babel, which never happened, okay, that was postponed, it was put off, then we can understand that this passage in Zechariah is not going to pertain to uh, the very end of the seven years. It has to do with the midpoint, this same day that Mystery Babylon is destroyed, okay, at the same time that the abomination of desolation is taking place. Zechariah 14, 3-5. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. And half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. And then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Azal. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. The Revelation 11 passage also refers to Jerusalem as Egypt, another place that the Israelites or the righteous fled from. Exodus 19 verses 3 and 4. And Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Keep in mind the eagle's wings because the woman who flees into the wilderness is going to flee on eagle's wings. That is a reference back to this passage when God himself led them out of Egypt. Uh, Exodus 15, 9 through 12. This is the song that Moses sang okay, after they were delivered at the Red Sea deliverance. Uh, this is just a portion of that. The enemy said, I will pursue. Okay, so that's the Egyptians. I'm going to pursue after uh, the, the children of Israel as they are heading out of Egypt. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be satisfied on them. I'll draw my sword and my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, amongst the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, and the earth swallowed them. Okay, I want you to notice this. It doesn't say that the sea swallowed them. It says the earth swallowed them. Okay, these passages in Exodus and Zechariah and the passages in Luke and Matthew are telling us more or less in a kind of a literal way what Revelation 12 is telling us in a symbolic way. This is Revelation 12, 13 through 16. Now, when the dragon saw that he'd been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she's nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. Okay, and this is a flood of troops, an army that's chasing them. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. So all these passages are clues that God has given us that we could decipher the story. And here it is. At the midpoint, at the time of the abomination of des desolation, Mystery Babylon will be destroyed, finally, after lo these many years. And it will happen in a, in a way that's similar to the destruction uh, of Noah and Lot. That Luke said that, that it was the day that Noah went into the ark and the day that Lot left Sodom that 
the destruction came on Sodom and came on the world. That is happening on a day, and it's the same day. The Lord will appear in glory to deliver the remnant of Israel. Okay? The Lord is going to appear in glory to deliver. God said that he led the children of Israel out of Egypt. How did he do that? He did it in a pillar of cloud and fire, the angel of the Lord. And then it says uh, in uh, Exodus that God saw from the pillar of cloud and fire, he saw the Egyptians. God and the angel of the Lord are the same person. It, this is Christ appearing. Christ led the children of Israel out of Egypt. He's the one who came between the children of Israel uh, and the Egyptian army. He is the one who uh, had deliverers come and deliver uh, Lot from Sodom. The Lord will appear in glory to deliver the remnant of Israel, and his coming will generate an earthquake. He's going to come to the Mount of Olives, and it's going to split open into a wide valley through which the woman, the remnant of Israel, will flee with the Lord guiding them. He will nourish the remnant in the wilderness for three and a half years. Okay, so as lightning flashes from the east to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be in his day. He will be revealed. Okay, where the body is, there will the eagles or vultures be gathered. He's going to nourish them for a time, times and half a time, or 1,260 days, or three and a half years. Once uh, this remnant, or God's people, begin to escape through that opening, Satan, the dragon, will attempt to pursue the remnant, and he's going to be swallowed up by the earth, just as Pharaoh's armies were swallowed up by the sea. But in that passage that we read in Exodus, it says the earth swallowed them. The destruction of the harlot will be carried out by the beast and the ten kings. And this is the plan of God for her destruction. But it's overseen by the angel with great authority who illuminates the world. And this is reminiscent of the description of Christ in Ezekiel 43 too. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. Revelation 18, 1 and 2. After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory, and he cried out mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. The harlot will be destroyed at the midpoint, before the beast begins his reign at the time of the abomination of desolation. We read this in Revelation 17, starting at verse 12. But the ten horns which you saw are ten kings, who have received no kingdom as of yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. And the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire, for God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind, and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. It's Babel. In that one hour, the ten kings will have authority along with the beast to kill a third of mankind. This is God's plan for the destruction of the harlot, which went from being one city, Babel, and spread out over the whole earth as Babylon the Great. As commander of the host of heaven, the Lord Jesus is going to oversee the judgment. All judgment has been given into his hand. He is the mighty resplendent angel of Revelation 18, 1 through 3. And after these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, 
and the earth was illuminated with his glory, and he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury." I just want you to notice this word fornication. It always has to do with the harlot. Okay, so when we see the 144,000 on Heavenly Mount Zion, that they are virgins, it means they have not fornicated with the harlot. That's uh, one of the women of Revelation. Okay, we're not talking about men who've never had sex. We're talking about people, men and women, who don't have anything to do with the harlot. Now, this is really important, this next thing I'm going to say. It's really important that you get this. Okay, The destruction of the harlot, which I believe is the New World Order, must take place before the reign of the beast or the mark of the beast. And Jesus will deliver his people before he oversees the destruction of Babel, when a third of mankind will be killed at the hands of the ten kings and the beast. Okay, a third of mankind is going to be killed at the midpoint, at the abomination of desolation. In addition to the remnant of Israel being delivered, we are also told that overcoming churches will be kept from the hour of trial which comes on the whole earth, to test the whole earth. The hour of trial is the judgment of the harlot, Mystery Babylon. This is referring to the deliverance of the 144,000 of Israel. Present day believers will already be present in heaven, having been caught up before the woman needs to flee into the wilderness. Revelation 12, 4 through 6. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. In addition to the Lord as the resplendent angel declaring the fall of Babylon, there's going to be three additional messengers who give warning at that same time. This is in Revelation 14 verses 6 through 10. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. And after these uh, angelic announcements, the reign of the beast will begin. People are to worship God and give him glory. Babylon has fallen. The reign of the beast has begun. Don't worship the beast, its image, or receive its mark. Okay, here's the bottom line. Here's what all these passages are telling us that the commander of the Lord's armies will oversee the destruction of Mystery Babylon, that Christ will rescue the 144,000 sometime before this hour of trial, before the destruction of one-third of the inhabitants of the earth. At the same time as the destruction of Babylon, he will deliver the remnant of Israel. He is the glorious or resplendent angel of Revelation 18 the same being that we see in Ezekiel's chapters 
8, 9, 10, and 43, who is the Lord. The destruction of the harlot, the great city, will be at the second woe, sixth trumpet, at the midpoint, the time of the abomination of desolation. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but there is more about the harlot in the book of Revelation than there is about the beast. There's a whole chapter devoted to her destruction. There's a whole trumpet that's devoted to her destruction. When it comes to uh, the beast and the mark of the beast, that's one chapter, okay? And then there's a little bit in chapter 16 and 19 that talk about how all of these, uh, the beast and the ten kings, they're all going to be destroyed along with the false prophet. The harlot is a whole different system. The beast and the false prophet, they don't have a system, okay? That's not a system. What that is, is a theocracy, okay, with the beast as um, the dragon's son, the seed of the serpent. This is a false theocracy where um, the false Christ is the ruler and the false prophet is his spokesman. The harlot is a system that's been in existence since the time of Babel. It was not judged at that time. People were not delivered from it at that time. God did reconnoiter Babel to see if it was as bad as he thought. And he says, yeah, this is really bad. Uh, we need to buy some time here. We're just going to scatter everybody. And so Babel, Babylon went over the whole face of the whole earth. And there is a day, uh, an hour a day, a month in the year when Babylon will finally be destroyed. The Tower of Babel, the Masons, the everything that the secret mystery societies have been um, carefully orchestrating for hundreds and thousands of years will all be brought down and then the reign of the beast will begin and they will not be a part of it. All right, so I hope you'll share this video with other people. This is in my book, A Kingdom of Priests, The Stories of Revelation. Uh, get an ebook; it's free. You can buy the paperback. Um, I hope you will share this with other people. Um, I hope I've taken some of the mystery out of what some of those passages mean. And I hope you can see that Christ is the one who is the resplendent angel of God, the angel of the Lord, who is God himself, who oversees the destruction of um, Babel, the harlot. We'll see you on another video. Till then, have a blessed day.